Good afternoon. Hello. 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 Welcome. I am um, really delighted to introduce um, our speaker today, Linda Wyman. Uh, Wyman. Linda is the executive chair and board and co-founder of Lynda.com, um, one of the most successful companies in online education today. Uh, how many of you know Lynda.com? Excellent. We have a <laughs> enthusiastic crowd. Um, I won't therefore tell you how extensive their library of uh, instructional videos is or how many different fields it covers ranging from technology and design to business um, but they are serving millions of people both individuals and companies around and government subscribers around the world um, linda herself is a self-taught computer expert author and educator and entrepreneur uh, she authored the first industry book on web design called designing web graphics in 1995. Um, she has taught at uh, the Art Center College of Design in Pasadena. She's worked as an animator and motion graphics director in the special effects film industry. She's taught at UCLA Extension, American Film Institute, and San Francisco State's uh, Multimedia Studies program. Maybe we can get her to Berkeley next. Um, Linda, along with her husband uh, and co-founder, Bruce Heaven, who is here today. Welcome, Bruce. Um, evolved Linda from its original concept as a free web resource for her students to the site, <laughs> the crowd is entering, for, for her books on web design to a registration hub uh, for physical classrooms and conferences to now an award-winning online learning company. Um, I will just, there was a tech crunch article about lynda.com and it um, says, you know, compared to the current wave of startups and MOOCs, uh, Linda is an old hand. Um, and one of the things that distinguishes it the most is not simply its reach and its success, but it, that it actually has a business model and it was profitable from the very beginning. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn this over to Linda herself. Um, I'm, I've been asked by the video producer that you turn your phones to airport mode um, it, so it won't interfere with the video recording and what airplane sorry airport yeah <laughs> yeah linda welcome thank you. well um thank you so much for inviting me i have a presentation that I hope takes up about half of the time we've been allotted so that there's lots of time for Q&A after. And it looks like I have to close something on my screen and turn on my little pointer. Um, so I, there's a, a very large conversation going on in the United States. And it's actually um, a global conversation. It's not just a US conversation about the skills gap, the future of education, the future of work, the future of knowledge. And in conjunction with telling you all a little bit about how lynda.com was created, the genesis for the ideas, and a little bit of the story of our company, I thought I would also touch on some of my beliefs about education and the future of education. And um, so I, I think that we all have been hearing um, incredibly bad news about how high the student loan debt is, about the dropout crisis, um, even if you have a, a degree, how it might not really ensure that there is a job awaiting you or that you will be fully employed to your capacity. And while a lot of industries have transformed, um, have been transformed through online presence, I think the way we shop, the way we date, the way we bank, the way we you know, find movies, get our entertainment, <laughs> education is still nascent in, in this area. And so um, the most recent internet trends report that comes out from Kleiner Perkins every year, Mary Meeker, this is a, a very highly uh, weighted trends report this year, um, proclaimed that education is at an inflection point. And that despite the fact that the US is the fourth largest in global spending on education, that we rank 27th and 71% of our college graduates are graduating with 30,000 plus in debt. 
and one half of college graduates feel unprepared for the job market, and that this is a $4 trillion industry. In fact, there was an article that came out in Forbes not too long ago that talked about how the online learning industry is poised to be a $107 billion industry in 2015. And there in that article, uh, it said that lynda.com, the online learning giant, is the 800 pound gorilla in the space. And the only photo in the article was one of me. So that's a lot to kind of carry on your shoulders. And, and uh, uh, I thought I might you know, step back a few steps and just talk a little bit about how we came up with the idea and how we are looking at the space and the problem. So um, there, you know, so the ingredients, the ingredients in, in this, um, this idea for this business, if I really trace it back to why I approach teaching and education the way that I have, I have to look back at um, being originally a very happy kind of straight A student and my parents had a terrible divorce. There was a lot of acrimony. I went to live with my grandparents. I was the oldest of three kids and at a very young age became responsible for my younger siblings and lived with um, grandparents who didn't really want us. And then my um, dad remarried and to a stepmother who really didn't want us and I kind of went from home to home being unwanted and went from being this happy student who loved school to being um, what I would now characterize as someone who was depressed, but there really wasn't that kind of language for it back then, and I didn't know what was wrong. I just basically didn't care about school anymore and felt extremely disenfranchised. And um, when I was in junior high, I read a book that is out of print today, but it describes a school that still exists called Summerhill, which is um, a book I mean, a school that, that um, was founded in England. They have a couple of other, uh, I think they have a couple of different um, campuses. But the premise of this grade school was that instead of having requirements that if you allowed students, even very young students, to choose what they wanted to learn, to provide great education, but let them decide whether they wanted to go to math or history or art or whatever it was, that ultimately you would create a, a group of students who understood the love of learning, self-motivation, and their own area of interest and passion, which is the ultimate goal for all of us, is to, you know, if we can settle in on a career that we're really passionate about, that is sort of the biggest gift anybody can ever ask for. So that um, book was hugely influential on me. And even though my parents couldn't afford to send me to private school, I ended up talking a headmaster of an alternative high school into letting me attend. And I went to a, a, a no longer, the school doesn't exist anymore. And it was really just a hippie school that let people do whatever they wanted. And I can't say that I got the greatest education um, there, but along the way, um, one of the classes that I took was a women's studies class. And at the time, I thought that feminism was about, you know, women who hated men and wanted to burn their bras. And I had this sort of terrible idea of what it was. And as I started to read the literature that was assigned through this class, and also this is right around the beginning of um, Ms. Magazine, the realization was, um, for me, for the book Summerhill was the realization that there's a different approach that you can have to education, which is more about what do you really want to learn. And what feminism represented to me was you can be anything. Um, my mom was a stay-home mom. Um, I didn't have anybody really in my lineage who I could look to who had, who had chosen a profession versus being you know, a housewife, a mother, and having um, very menial jobs, I think um, what a lot of young women today do not realize is that um, in the, when I was growing up in the 1950s and 60s, that there were really very few role models of women who, who were professionals. And that the expectation for me was, um, I'd love for you to go to college so that you can meet a man who can support you better than your dad could support me. And that was literally the whole reason why she might want me to go to college. So I ended up going to this progressive high school and um, 
you know, probably dealing with a lot of stuff that I had to deal with that was just more emotional than, than academic at that point in my life just because of my troubled childhood. And I ended up also going to a college called Evergreen State College, which is a progressive college, which much, much follows in the footsteps of Evergreen and does not have um, prerequisites. A lot of the, the courses are cross-disciplinary. And when I was back on campus, I came across this page in the expectations of an Evergreen graduate. And basically, those expectations are that you're going to graduate and have a self-initiative be a collaborative person, know how to communicate, be an independent thinker, be able to employ qualitative and quantitative thinking to problems, and be able to synthesize ideas. And um, so I came from this extremely unorthodox style of education and survived a very troubled beginning that had nothing to do with my, my academic uh, you know, pedigree. And I think as I left college, what I left with was the idea that I could be anything, that what I should pursue is what interests me, and if it doesn't work out, do something else. And that's really, if I just look back at my, at my background, that is exactly what I did. I ended up um, working in the special effects industry and um, having a child, and when I was, I was 34, my daughter was born, and it was really tough to continue working in that industry. And while, I'd been, um, while I had been working, I had discovered the computer and my, um, the way that I got my first computer, because I graduated from college before computers were invented. So um, the Apple II Plus came out in 1978, and I graduated in 1976. So, um, in 1980, I discovered the computer, and I, I thought, you know, I opened it up, I read the manual, and I thought, this is written for engineers, this isn't written for real people. And so, somehow I just sort of figured it out myself, and then I became very interested in sharing what I was learning with other people. And along the way, I was invited to, um, I was working on lots of projects, and I started to work on computer graphics on my computer. And I did uh, some work on Star Trek V that got me some press and attention, and magazines started asking me to write about the techniques that I was using um, with the computer and, the compu and computer graphics. And I was invited to go speak at Art Center College of Design, which is one of the top art colleges in the world. And um, they, I, after giving one talk, they invited me to become a faculty member there. And so that was sort of a very, um, you know, I, I, I think uh, learning the computer was something that I just totally did on my own. I know I was, I was introduced as a self-taught computer expert, and I think a lot of people, if we're really truthful about anything that we know, we've been self-taught, because you can't teach somebody something. Somebody has to actually, you actually have to learn. It's not about what somebody is telling you. It's about what you're retaining and absorbing and integrating, and so, um, I think my method for teaching myself how to use the computer was to throw the manual away and just start trying things. And then I had just a capacity to explain how I had done that to other people, and it was, it was basically a retracing of steps. It was remembering where I had struggled and then reinforcing those areas. And instead of teaching like the manuals were trying to teach, which was lording a lot of knowledge over others, the way that I taught was more to really impart the information. And um, I was invited to teach at Art Center College of Design, and one of the things that I really loved doing and that I realized very early on was I loved writing the handouts, and I hated it when my students took notes because if you've ever tried to learn a computer program, you need to actually be watching your screen. And so when you're reading a computer manual or a book, you're, you're, it's a disengagement from what you're actually needing to watch. And so my solution to this was, don't take notes, watch my screen, and I'm gonna give you such great handouts that you didn't need to take notes. The actual process of note taking is going to inhibit your ability to learn what I'm teaching. And at Art Center, my classes were um, so popular. There was, I was teaching a motion graphics class at the time, 
which is um, basically how you would take something like Photoshop and make everything move and animate. And um, it was so popular that people would actually camp out overnight to try to get into this class. So I suggested to the dean that if he would let me um, give the class in auditorium, in, in an auditorium setting, not unlike this, except there were 100 people in the auditorium. And then I could assign teaching assistants to work with the students individually that I could teach more people because I felt this pressure that so many people wanted to come to this class and they couldn't get in. It, it, it upset me. So I realized that this desire to teach more people at once was sort of a little precursor to lynda.com and that's why I'm telling this story. Um, I ended up, like everybody, discovering the internet around 1993, 1994, and I immediately went to the bookstore to see if there was a book that I could assign to my art students because maybe before a lot of other people, what I realized was that this was going to be the new calling card. This was going to be how brochures were going to be delivered, how business cards were going to be delivered, and that people who were artists were going to need to understand how to work in this new medium. So. I went to a bookstore looking for a book on this topic and realized that all of the books were written a lot like the manuals were written for computers. They were written for engineers, to engineers, not to the art students that I was teaching. So I realized, okay, well, I've been teaching at college level. I love writing documentation. And so maybe I should write this book. And I ended up being unable to convince a publisher to publish um, my book but I convinced a magazine to let me write installations on a monthly, uh, as a monthly column, which ended up becoming the manuscript for my first book, which was um, called Designing Web Graphics. It was a, um, not an overnight success, but within the first year, uh, it had become a national and an international bestseller, and eventually, um, I, I wrote and published many books. They were translated into lots of languages. And I suddenly had a much bigger audience than I had teaching at Art Center. Um, and so th for me, that was a real revelation that, um, one, you could reach so many people through publishing information versus one-to-one -one, um, education. And also, I experienced passive income for the first time, which was that I got paid every time the book was sold. And so suddenly, my husband and I, who's in the audience, partner, um, had enough money to buy our first house. And so we made this other kind of big leap, which was to move to Ojai, California, population 7,000 people. And um, while we were living there, I miss teaching, and so my husband had this idea, well, maybe we should open a school, and we opened the very first school that focused exclusively on web design. It was before you could study that in college. It was just in, very, in the very, very early days, and um, we, we just bootstrapped the school with the money that we'd gotten from royalties from the book. We would write all of the documentation. This was you know, an early iMac. This is um, me in, in the classroom, and um, you can see it's not unlike this classroom with a projector and a screen, and we had Macs on one side and PCs on the other. And, um, and something surprising happened, which was people had so much thirst to come to these classes that they were selling out. And, we, and, and so my husband said, well, why don't you hire other teachers? And that idea had not ever occurred to me, and I was saying to him, but it's called lynda.com. You know, we named the website lynda.com. The company is called lynda.com. So aren't they coming to hear me teach? And he said, I, I don't think so. I think if you were to bring on other people and other topics that um, that, that that would work. And so this is an example of uh, Garrick Chow, who is still one of the teachers on lynda.com. Um, I think he's been with us for 12 or 13 or 15 years. I don't know how long. But um, that ended up being, being very true, that there was um, a very big demand for the topic, that there, were, uh, there was no way that I could teach all of the classes myself, that I had enough understanding of good teaching and other good teachers, and because I had become an expert in the field with this book that I had written, I was exposed to a lot of the other top teachers and best people in the field, and so bringing on excellent teachers to the school was something that came fairly easily. Meanwhile, I was still writing books, and there came a point where I wanted to write a book about Photoshop, and my book publisher said, 
we already have authors who write about Photoshop, so you can't do it. So being the kind of person, maybe you're figuring this out, that I don't easily take no for an answer, um, came up with the idea of doing videos of the topics that the book publisher wouldn't let me write books about. And so um, very early on, we started to make um, our own VHS tapes. And you know, Bruce designed all the covers. I physically edited the videos, recorded the videos. It was like a two-person operation. And um, we eventually put all of these lessons online and you know, went away from VHS. And you kind of fast forward to today, and we have hundreds of thousands of videos that we've created from hundreds of authors. And we reach millions of people. And um, I think some of the things that I picked up along the way that were early influencers in the business, one teaching at Art Center, one of the philosophies of Art Center was they didn't hire professional teachers, they hired working professionals who were good teachers. And that's been the same idea that we've used with lynda.com. Um, with video, that whole idea of don't take notes during my class is sort of an unnecessary layer because you're listening, you're watching, and so that removes that um, disconnection from reading words versus seeing something. Um, the teaching in the auditorium and reaching more people than you can reach um, you know, in, a, in a small classroom. Um, choices of teachers and subjects, there's the Summerhill principle, the idea that you trust people. You know, here's a big repository of, of, of classes and teachers, and it's, not, it's, it's really different from the idea that you're studying this major, these are, you know, these are your, this is your curriculum, and then this is your degree. It's, it's a very different idea, and it's more akin to the idea of a library. And then, um, of course, the idea that you know, it doesn't matter that I'm a woman, I can do this. And I think that was just the early inspiration of, of the feminist books that I had read. So some of the business model that we've incorporated, um, first of all, a lot of, uh, a lot of things on the internet obviously are free, but we're learning that free isn't free. Um, all of the privacy issues around all of the free services, what we've all come to realize is that we are the product and that is the cost. And so with lynda.com, we've always charged a very small amount of money compared to the value that you get. Um, and because of that, we've been able to pay all of our contributors, unlike a lot of other online models. So we have teachers on lynda.com who, like me, are buying their first houses, um, you know, having enough income that is sort of being earned in a not completely passive income, but you, you, know, you create something once and you get paid for it many times, and that was something that, that we had learned from the book publishing. Um, and then the teaching pedagogy that was really early on, um, just a very, to me, um, this idea of explaining things so that it's clear and trying to figure out the most simple way to explain something that is complex with the objective not to be lording information over others and using every buzzword and, and technical term, but instead actually creating education that is inclusive and empowering. And um, we've also, we were really lucky in some ways in that we 100% bootstrapped our company and we were able to just be in control of how we use the proceeds. So while we were profitable um, every year, we invested that back into ourselves, into our product, into our people, and into our community. So some of the teaching principles that are in practice at lynda.com include you know, really giving context. I think that is the, um, you know, we all hear about, you know, in, in writing, you know, what, when, why, how, and these are really the same principles when you teach. And um, so we instill this same philosophy with all of the different teachers and experts who come through lynda.com. The idea, show me, don't tell me, um, video is a visual medium, so, instead of um, you know, just using a lot of words and terms to really give visual examples is, is really important. The explaining of technical terms, the chunking of information so it's really broken down into bite-sized bits, which not only helps with uh, learning and retention, but it also t helps with indexing and searchability and you all in information sciences um, can, I'm sure, really appreciate the importance of that. Another thing that we do is we close caption 
almost all of our videos, which gives us a text transcript, which is also indexable. Um, and then we also approach teaching from a lot of different perspectives. So in the beginning, we were basically just teaching tools. And now we have um, expanded into doing documentaries that highlight creative professionals or somebody who's actually a working professional in, a, in one of the fields that we teach, um, showing projects, showing um, uh, having things like challenges and um, teaching tools and, um, and, so, and also principles and foundations of things. So um, in the very beginning, it was, it was all you know, really sort of transitory skills like how to do web design and you know for anybody in here who read my first book or, or was back or was in web design in, back in those days there was a different program to make an animated gif and a different program to make something transparent and a different program to use type and you know so it was all very kind of transactional and all about tools and how to do things and so um, what we realized was in video that we also have the opportunity to give foundational information and talk about the principles and the ideas of things. And so we've really expanded into doing live action, not just the screen capture of tools. And so some of the, um, the differences between a classroom and a library, I know um, I was speaking earlier about the differences between lynda.com and the MOOCs, and I think what MOOCs attempt to do is to emulate a, um, a physical school online. And what lynda.com has taken a really different approach, which is to put a library of media online, an indexed library of media. And so you have, instead of in a classroom, one to few, one to many, um, instead of a one-size-fits-all where you're all listening to my lecture, I can look at your faces, some of you are tuning, you know, tuning me out, some of you are you know, enraptured. I mean, this is like how any live classroom is, right? Everybody's got different stuff going on in your life. You've got different pressures. Um, but when you have a video, you're, you can rewind it, you can uh, watch it again. There's sort of a whole different dynamic to something that is synchronous where you know, it's sort of going to work or not going to work versus asynchronous, where you can do it on your own time. Um, and so the idea of being able to um, reach a lot more uh, people, but what we're doing is sort of a group learning what you can do in a library, if you think about the difference between if we were all sitting in a library, we would all be doing something. Every one of you would be doing something different than the other, where we're all sitting together in this classroom and we're all kind of doing the same thing. Um, and I think you know, the idea of being able to do a mashup of resources is something that a library allows, where if you go into a physical library, you're going, you may be pulling down you know, five books, you might read a sentence from one, a chapter from another, read the whole book. It's, you're mashing up that information. And you're, it's sort of fitting you and what you're interested in, whereas um, you know, something that isn't happening that can happen in the classroom is more of a dialogue where we could have a group discussion, we could have Q&A, there's a whole other layer that really isn't possible online. And I think that that is something that I think deeply about and that lynda.com has thought deeply about is what, it, what is best done in person and what is best done online. And I think that there are clear economies of things that happen to scale much better online and there are you know, clear examples of things that happen so much better face to face. And so, you know, some of the things about video learning I've already talked about, I think the anonymity of it is really powerful. Um, another social dynamic of group learning is, you know, comparing yourself to somebody else. They're asking a better question than I'm asking. Oh, they get it. I don't get it. There's sort of none of that in video learning because of the anonymity and the searchability, the fact that it is built in, personalized, and just in time. So I just want to shift the conversation maybe dramatically to how this all fits into the, into the skills gap. And I think that um, really when we are talking about a degree, it's a euphemism. It's a promise. It's not, it's not just a degree. It's the idea that you're going to have enough money, you're going to be able to have that kind of financial security, to be secure, to have a home, to have a family, to have happiness. And obviously, um, that isn't necessarily being delivered today. But I think there's a lot of pressure on um, education to be more tailored to where we have gaps in skills. And so if we look at what the top 10 jobs in 2014 were, 
um, you know, so, probably, uh, I guess you could ask, you know, do we have enough formal education in these fields because these are the top skills of 2014. But if you really carry that argument through and you think about jobs that didn't exist 10 years ago, I graduated from college over 40 years ago, so you know, 10 years is a minor amount compared to that. There are so many jobs that didn't exist, so had we tailored schools to only focus in on these very specific <coughs> skills, it doesn't matter because there are going to be new skills 10 years from now that we can't predict. And so I think that that idea is a flawed idea. And instead, if you look at what employers are saying they're missing, they're really about more than just what your discipline, what your area of discipline is. It's a lot more about social skills and being able to make sense of things, your emotional intelligence, your ability to think, um, your awareness of, of uh, different cultures and your empathy. Um, and I think that uh, one of the wonderful things about being in physical school is the idea that you get to collaborate with peers, you get to actually network, um, practice expressing your ideas, be challenged to do you know, written communication, visual communication, whatever type of communication that is. And it's one of these situations outside of the workforce where you really get to practice things that are very hard to ever practice again. Um, and I think in an era where our, uh, our formal education has stressed so much teaching to the test and this idea that um, standardized tests are how we measure ourselves, even in Mary Meeker's um, argument about education being at an inflection point that we rank 27th, well, we, we come up with these rankings because of standardized tests. And so is, is passing a test, is teaching to a test, is this instilling the kinds of skills that employers are looking for? You know, I clearly don't think so. I think the proof is out there that it, that's not working. And I think really what education has sort of become more about is memorization and rote teaching and rote learning, at least, you know, outside of, I would say, college is where you come and hopefully break out of all of this grooming that you've had up until this point. But the sad thing is, is for the last decade, um, at the exact same moment, really, that the, of the internet inflection point, we've been more and more forcing students into this idea that um, standardized tests are the way to measure the success of their education. And um, I think that you know, what we have is that we have a world where we can memorialize information. And that's really, in some ways, what information sciences is about, in some ways, what our library is about. It's this idea of, of uh, you know, being able to access, in a random way, information and get it but you have to understand how to make sense of it, then that onus is on you. And so, you know, this really does change the role of a teacher from a sage on the stage to a guide on the, on the side, which, you know, really means that rather than the teacher standing at the podium and being the source of all knowledge, um, putting that on to the students that um, we all learn differently, we can all synthesize differently, we, we can interpret information differently, and those dialogues and that collaboration and that interaction is actually the premium ticket, and that's something that cannot really be done easily online. Um, and so I think that you know, when we talk about education, that's something that we think we're doing to others to impart knowledge, but it's very different than learning. Learning is something incredibly personal that happens to people very differently. And there are a couple of different constructs that I point to. One is this learning period, pyramid, which talks about how we learn from a lecture. We learn so little from a lecture, 5%. If we read something, 10%. If we see something visually, 20%. If something's demonstrated, 30%. Um, if I think about lynda.com and videos, maybe we're hitting that 30% threshold, 40% threshold. But really where you start to truly learn is when you have a discussion about something, when you put something to practice, and the highest way to learn anything is to actually teach it to somebody else. 
And um, this other 70-20-10 framework, which um, was research that was uh, created by the Center for Creative Leadership, um, talks about how in their surveys that working professionals said they learned most from you know, just the tough knocks of life, 20% um, from you know, teachers or the boss or a mentor, and about 10% from courses and learning. So really we have to apply knowledge. It's not just about this, rote, this idea of rote memorization. That, that just isn't the most effective way to learn. So I'm incredibly um, passionate about project-based learning and learning that is more open-ended and um, programs that sort of build the ability to be thinkers and doers versus memorizers. And um, I think if we were really teaching to increase job readiness in K through 12, that we would be doing things um, very differently, uh, asking students to do more open-ended projects, um, learn how to write resumes, cover lover letters, uh, go to networking events, um, how to participate as a digital citizen in social media, interviewing skills, research skills, um, learning design and, and practicing design. And, um, and negotiation. And so um, I guess that that is, you know, to me, the future of education is how can we leverage what we can't do so easily online and how do we foster these incredibly important social skills that are just being so undervalued in K through 12. And I don't really personally think online is the place to do that. I mean, it's a good second class citizen if you have nothing better and no other way to do it. Um, so at, at lynda.com, you know, we really believe that we call it content is queen. It's putting learning and learners at the center. It's really thinking deeply about how people actually learn and believing that people should have the, um, we, they should have our trust to know what they want to learn, how they want to learn, and that it's our job to just put out the very best most understandable materials that we possibly can. And so um, that concludes the presentation part of my talk, and I'm really looking forward to your, to your questions. Thank you. So if you have a question, I would ask you to take the mic before you speak, because we're, it's being used for recording. Hi. Uh, Firstly, thanks for coming. Uh, I have uh, one question about the, uh, I think Linda and a lot of the other MOOCs have been solving the accessibility problem for people who want to access more information and how, how to learn. But uh, like you touched upon the learning pyramid and uh, I think there's a lot of space where we can improve upon in terms of how we learn itself. And I think some of the companies which are trying to do that, like Newton or maybe Grocket, those are experiments which I think even they have now moved away from that. Do you think uh, the efficiency problem needs to be, so or is going to be solved anytime soon, or are there people who are doing interesting stuff in that? Or um, is it that we'll have to be solving the accessibility problem for a long time? Well, I think that the accessibility problem, as you put it, um, is a much easier problem to solve and I do think that there are ways that online could facilitate some of the other type of learning, which is more experiential learning, open-ended problem solving, collaborative type of learning. Um, it's, it's probably, um, uh, you know, it's definitely a much harder thing to scale and do online. It's a much easier thing to do in person. And so um, what, what I have been advocating is that that is something that people, that if you're a, a student, that you understand the importance of face-to-face -face interaction with other people. That if that means going to meetups, if it means going to discussion groups, if it means going to school, if it means joining a club, whatever that might mean, that that, that, that skill set is actually something that is, in my view, much better achieved. Um, in person. Um, I think that there are clearly online and techno technological, you know, um, helper sort of apps and ways to galvanize people and organize people. And uh, 
I think we're still in the infancy. You know, there's clearly a lot more that has been done with the accessibility and sort of knowledge um, availability aspect, as you're as you're describing. Oh, I'm, I guess I have a similar question. Will this work or not? Um, I'm trying to uh, get people trained in, like, especially a lot of undergrads trained in parts of data science, which is a new up, up and coming field, and all, while also trying to get real life clients for them, actually, at the same time. Do you have any uh, tips or uh, about how to get these two things aligned together? Because again, getting real world experience is critical, but also uh, in working in groups is critical. And like, the, I'm trying to find a convergence with all of these factors. And I, I see very few classes that offer you, I mean, real world experience uh, outside of the classroom, while also giving you the, the training necessary uh, there, yeah. uh, and are you a student or a faculty? Uh, I'm a student right now. Yeah. Okay, so I think I think you've really touched on something important, and I'm not sure that um, the concept of providing internships as part of your college curriculum or education has really been embraced very widely. There are some schools that insist on internships. The school that I went to insisted on internships, so I had an internship at, at Evergreen. Um, and I think, you know, that there are a lot of nonprofits and businesses out there that are so hungry for help. And if your school isn't providing for it, I really believe it's something that would even be good for you as a student to try to achieve on your own. To you know, whether it's cold calling people or just putting yourself out there. Look, I'm working on my thesis or I'm working on this project, and I really need some real world experience because even just that process of cold calling and, and putting yourself out there is part of what you need to do as a, you know, as a working professional. And um, I think there are, you know, some schools that partner in that effort better than other schools, but I also think it's something that students, you know, could and should foster on, on, your, on your own. Oh, hi. Um, I used your book back in 1996, to the yellow one, to learn um, HTML, and I thought at the time it was like, wow. It's so different, you know, and it was fun. But anyway, um, I'm sort of curious, how long did it take you to write that book? And because what it impresses me is like how fast you turn it around. Um, the, the book took about six months to write. And it was, I think, every waking moment that I had where I wasn't, you know, working. And at the time, I was a single mom, too. So I would literally put my daughter to bed around nine o'clock and then stay up until one or two in the morning writing the book. Um, but it, it almost wrote itself in some ways because it was a big research project. It was, you know, I didn't know HTML. I didn't know how to do any of those things that I wrote about. But I reached out to people. Part of the reason why I'm married to my husband um, is because um, he was somebody who I reached out to to help me with understanding some of the data that I didn't quite understand. I would go to conferences. I would ask people, you know, I don't understand this about color. Can you explain this to me? Or I don't understand this about, you know, how you, how you make something 3D or how you do this or that. And so I think that, you know, that is maybe it touches upon the same topic that the other questions centered around, around getting real world experience. And in some ways, just having the gumption and the guts to um, put yourself out there not knowing something and say, I'm going to teach this to myself and I'm going to learn it enough to teach it to other people because that really is a way different pressure than just learning something to know it for yourself. And I think almost any professional teacher who loves the craft of teaching will tell you that that's part of what they love about it is it, is it inspires you to not just you know, learn something to check a box, but learn something to actually, you know, give it to other people. And that was, um, so it was, it was a huge amount of work, but it was also such a fun project. And it's funny because I started working on a different type of book, which is more of a, um, of a book around the topic of this, of this talk, which is just more an opinion piece about where we're at in education today and what the future potentially could look like. And that was a really different kind of book to write. Um, you know, it did not come to me nearly as easily. Uh, it's, it's about half written, so I can't, I couldn't say, but I hope, um, you know, I hope it will, it will come out soon. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I'm here. Um, so there's a big evolution of lynda.com over the years. So I'm, um, 
wondering about the skills gap and where we are in education and learning. Um, what's happening next for Lina.com? Where's the next evolution piece? Because I, and I, I'm sure that's gonna be, I mean, you're gonna come up, come up with something also interesting given the times that we're living in. And I'm wondering where, you, where your mind is going with that. Well, I think we're putting a huge amount of effort into uh, international, actually. Because the problem that we solve is not an American problem, it's a human problem. And um, so we have been working, um, it's not a lot to show for it just yet, but uh, creating the same materials in different languages, deploying sites that are in different languages, and reaching a lot of very new audiences. Um, there is a, a big effort on improving the delivery platform that we have. Um, I think while we're very good at making instructional videos, and that kind of goes back to the roots of just being very good at writing a book about something technical in a way that people could understand, I'd say that's really our, whole, our hallmark style. But our goal is to also have the website be a tool that helps that learning, helps you with that learning. So that means things like, um, you know, playlists, being able to mix and match, create your own curriculum, um, be able to communicate, you know, share things with others, do challenges with others. There's a lot that is to come with the website, which hopefully is going to make the learning, you know, learning even better on lynda.com. And then um, I think just um, the scale and scope of the different kinds of topics we can teach. So we're constantly expanding. In fact, I was um, saying that we had a big strategic meeting yesterday about our future publishing roadmap for 2015. And data sciences is actually a really huge um, topic for us. We're finding that there's so much need in that Area. And even in our own company, we didn't used to have a data sciences group, and now we have a data sciences group. So I think um, there is, you know, there just are things that change about business. There's so much data now with with big data and the ability to do analytics on so many different things, but um, also to infuse the analytics with some humanity and qualitative thinking. And so um, I think, you know, while we are very uh, reactive to what we teach, like data sciences, for example, that's something that we're, we're being asked for a lot. We also try to be preemptive and proactive about what's coming. And so that is um, something that really requires a different skill set than just you know looking at, at data. So um, I'd say that that's one of the things that we, that we really um, believe is our role is to be predictive of what is going to come next and make sure that we've we've got it there for people who are counting on us to, to learn. So. Yes. Hi. Um, Hi. So I've been to a lot of the uh, American Library Association conferences and I, yeah. I've noticed like maybe the past few couple that uh, Linda.com has had a nice like big booth that looked really nice and everything. And I was just wondering if um, like institutional sales and organizational sales has become like more of a, um, a part of the business model over the past couple of years or, some, or oh, anything like oh, that. Oh, yeah. I mean, what's funny is our, our institutional sales started in higher ed. And they started because a teacher um, really wanted to be able to assign lynda.com videos instead of books to her class. And she just needed some additional reporting and administrative functionality. So she actually helped us write the back end and create the product that has now become um, used by companies, nonprofits, government, um, uh, education. Um, I know we have a couple of li little licenses across the Berkeley campus, but we have a lot of campuses where the whole campus has Linda. Um, Harvard, uh, Harvard is one of them, Duke is one, UCLA, USC. Um, and so that has definitely become a really huge part of our business. And, um, but it really, it's, you know, what's, what I love about it is it still leverages the core idea. And um, it's, it's a slightly different way of packaging it and distributing it, but we're one of the very few companies that does both what's called B2B and B2C. So, you know, business, business to consumer, business to business. Um, and I know that it's, it's been, you know, something that we're really proud of, that, we, that we're able to do that, so, yeah. 
Um, tagging along to the questions about the future, I'm curious, uh, in terms of instructional videos, especially with mobile, if you see any emerging trends, what kind of future you see in terms of instructional videos online? Um, it's a great question, and I, you know, I think ubiquity is just a huge issue for us. That's another one of our themes in terms of um, being everywhere, not just being, right now we have um, mobile apps, we have tablet apps, we are available on um, most devices and on computers, but we're working towards set-top. There's a lot of you know, new opportunities to have videos shown on set-top, and um, I can only imagine you know, five, 10 years from now, we're gonna have all new types of ways of, of consuming media that, don't even, that we don't know what they are today. So the idea of ubiquity is to, um, you know, to, to play anywhere and then also um, what that means. You know, what that means is if I, if I stop watching a video on my phone, when I kick it up on the computer, it ought to pick up, remember what I did on my phone. And so there's a lot of technical challenges to it. And um, it's definitely a tall order, especially when you have as many devices and, and customers and languages and you know demographics. So it's actually a fairly daunting project to be ubiquitous, but it's definitely a goal of ours and we do see that that's extremely important going, going forward. I think I'm gonna take maybe the last question and then unless there's anybody else, I don't wanna wear you and, out. And I can stay a little longer if people have other questions. First of all, thank you. This has been, it's a fascinating presentation. I'm so inspired by what you've done and by your story. Um, one of the things that, that happens when you tell the story is that it's a story of success. And so I'm wondering if you'll tell us about bumps along the road. I can't imagine there haven't been some of those, and I'd, I'd like to hear at least one or two of those. Yeah, um, it's a great question, and I do tend to, um, I bet you if I asked my husband, he'd, he'd come up with something better than, better than I will. I know that, you know, some of them I talked about, like it was actually really bumpy to get that book contract to write that book. And um, I was told no. I did submit it to publishers, and I was told no. And I also, um, I then, you know, was able to convince a, a magazine publisher to let me do it in installments. And then I finally, you know, had two different publishers who fought over getting it, and I got a good advance. And then when I wrote the manuscript, I wrote it in this what I thought was a very humanistic, approachable style. And they returned the manuscript to me in a very technical, like they had changed all my writing to make it more like the manuals that I was, I was rebelling against. And so I, I remember, you know, reading through my contract, realizing that I had the, um, if they rejected my manuscript, that I could retain the rights. So I summoned up all my courage and called the publisher and said, you've ruined my manuscript. I'm not putting my name to it. I want it back. He said, okay, we'll change it. And then the rest was history and it became like this great book. But, you know, there is part of it, um, I think um, I've made some, error, some, some judgments, errors in judgment. There was a point like when we first started the online library and we were doing the subscription service, the first, um, well, we had had a pretty successful school, first of all. When we had our school, the first year revenue, $1.7 million. Um, then when we started our video business, that was pretty successful. But when we started to put the videos online, it started to cannibalize the other, you know, people stopped coming to the school, they stopped buying the videos, and here it was way cheaper. But we hadn't hit critical mass, so it was really hurting our bottom line. And I remember um, saying to my book agent, you know, I think we should sell this online you know, video part of what we're doing. And my husband was like, no, you don't. This is actually growing just fine. Just give it time. And he was absolutely right. And one day I went into his studio and I just saw this note that had been scribbled and it was a spreadsheet, but all handwritten. And he had actually predicted five-year revenue out. And it, it was, when I was looking at it, it was about at the five-year point and it was almost to the penny accurate in terms of how much it was going to earn. And he just had that, foresight that I didn't have, you know, I was ready to give up. So I don't know if those are the best examples, but those are a couple. That's great. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. So All right. Thank you. Thank you.